Hey everyone, Dave Kalischuk here, Chief Flight Instructor for Owen Sound Flight Services and I'm going to be bringing you some training videos on the JPI EDM 830 Engine Data Management System. Um, this is basically a really fancy engine monitor that is installed in our aircraft that we recently had put in just a couple of months ago. And I found that um, in doing research online there was not a great amount of information on there. Um, there are some old videos that JPI has put out that are probably 10 plus years old and um, they're lacking some new information. There have been updates to the software since then and um, there's a lot of different sort of user interface that is uh, lacking and also in general we just want to um, make a more comprehensive training program. So uh, what we've done at the flight school here in Owen Sound is uh, develop a training program um, that is relatively comprehensive um, it's broken down into six different modules and this is the introduction module, so number one. And it's going to give you uh, some great insight into this engine monitor. Um, this is primarily made for our students and our rental pilots, but uh, since we've gone to the trouble of putting this together, might as well put it online on our YouTube channel and then you have it uh, for free to watch. Maybe you're considering an engine monitor, uh, maybe you have this installed in your aircraft, maybe you might learn a couple new things about it. So, just want to put this information out there for everybody to use um, to further the education in our lives in aviation, because that's really what uh, aviation is all about. It's this constant, evolving, learning um, experience that uh, really has no ending. Um, so, the JPI EDM 830. Uh, let's jump into the introduction uh, module. So, um, the EDM 830 uh, we've equipped two of our Cessna 172 aircraft with it. We're operating a 1976 M model Cessna 172s and uh, we put these uh, fancy engine monitors in there. So I'll just give you a closer cockpit uh, look here at uh, CTJ. So this is uh, the, actually the first airplane I ever flew um, 25 years ago. So she's still going. Um, 25 years later you know, it's uh, I think on its ninth engine by now, every 2,000 to 2,400 hours um, we do an engine change. So it's uh, seen a lot of flight time and a lot of, um, a lot of pilots and a lot of learning. But now we are upgrading the cockpit even further to uh, operate this um, EDM-830. So uh, what you see is it's in the upper right hand position in the panel and um, it has a number of different data fields and information that is displayed. And actually, technically, this is um, an inverted installation, so it's actually upside down with the buttons on the top of the unit. Traditionally, they're on the bottom of the unit. Um, but uh, for spacing, so that we could uh, keep our old VOR instruments there, we um, had them inverted up here. It's a good use of this panel space as well, so we didn't have to lose a slot there. A uh, cool thing about this installation is it actually also communicates with the uh, GPS. This is just a basic VFR GPS. Uh, it's a Garmin Aero 500. And um, even though it's a, a basic VFR GPS, it can still send data to the uh, EDM830, which is really cool. So what you get from that are neat uh, things regarding um, fuel. So if you have a destination planned uh, in the GPS, it will give you the amount of fuel required to get to that destination, the amount of fuel you'll have left on board when you reach that destination, uh, and then also some information on fuel economy uh, in miles per gallon, which is really neat. And that, you know, that's pretty, uh, uh, I was pretty excited about that, even with a, a basic GPS like a Garmin Aero 500, that integration is really, really useful for, um, for our pilots. So that's pretty neat. Uh, here's a uh, picture of FWQ. So this is our IFR aircraft uh, that we use for IFR training. It's got a Garmin 530 GPS. Uh, we even have a Garmin G5 HSI that we put in. And again, the same thing, same position, same orientation, same layout. Um, a big key to um, easy transitional training, successful training is consistency. So we're trying to keep things consistent across the fleet as much as possible. So in the same position and now it's connected to a Garmin 530. And that Garmin 530 again sends also um, the same fuel uh, data information to the EDM 830 and back and forth and they can talk to each other and uh, we can get more information on that. 
So very cool installation. We're really excited about having these in the airplanes. There is uh, a lot to learn with these um, units. Um, and they are meant to um, augment or supplement the um, existing gauges. So um, the EDM830 is not a certified replacement as a primary instrument, but it is a fantastic secondary instrument. So things like uh, the original oil temperature and pressure cluster and fuel gauges, they're all still required. The um, ammeter is still required. Um, it's just that you can also then get that information in a digital way as well. So you can't resolve, uh, you can't rely on this as a primary instrument, but as a secondary, it's a fantastic way to uh, gain critical insight into the aircraft, uh, operating temperatures, um, uh, everything. So it's, it's quite a remarkable unit. So we want to talk a little bit about um, why we uh, upgraded and why did we put these in the panel in the first place. So um, why the upgrade? Well, to uh, teach an appreciation for engine care. That's a big one. As I mentioned, um, CTJ has gone through uh, about nine engines over the years, and that's um, each one hitting TBO and then some. Um, but I think we can uh, even manage that engine system better if we can monitor temperatures and temperature changes, temperature shifts. Um, we can uh, better care for the engine by keeping those temperatures in check, so not getting too hot, not getting too cold, not making abrupt changes. Um, we can also um, prolong the engine service life by doing that so we can gain more time out of the engine and operate the engine even further uh, past TBO more safely uh, to a point if we can uh, have more data. The key is data and information so that we can constantly evaluate uh, what's happening uh, in the engine. Um, fuel management is a, is a huge one. So the uh, EDM 830 uh, has some amazing fuel management tools that tell us everything from how much fuel we're burning to how much is left on board, uh, as well as um, the effects of leading the mixture and what that is actually producing as a result on uh, fuel efficiency and also um, engine efficiency. And as you've learned, it maybe in ground school, too much, uh, too rich a mixture isn't good either, neither is too lean a mixture. And there are, there's a, a balance in between and a lot of pilots um, sort of shy away from uh, mixture control uh, post license because uh, when you pull that red knob back too far the engine makes sounds that people don't want to hear. <laughs> um, but leaving it all the way rich is also really bad for the engine. You just don't hear it uh, but you see it later. Fouled spark plugs and things like that. So this will uh, help us with understanding of fuel management and uh, with proper mixture leaning techniques we can see um, the effects right there directly uh, in a fuel flow. We can see the effects of leaning the mixture in fuel flow. Uh, actually a really uh, really fantastic demonstration that I like to do with students with the EDM830 is to have them level off at uh, cruise altitude say three or four thousand feet or wherever we're at and uh, with the mixture full rich they can see the fuel flow and they can see the endurance time to empty and then by leaning out the mixture uh, they can see how much more endurance is added and it's actually quite remarkable how much the endurance changes, how much more time in the air you can get just by leaning the mixture out, you know, you can gain another 30-40 minutes even more by, by leaning the mixture properly. Um, the same thing with uh, RPM settings, you know, if you uh, have say 2300 RPM versus 2400 RPM, you can really see that extra gallon, gallon and a half per hour and how the endurance just drops off dramatically when you increase power. So you might get there five minutes sooner, um, but at the same time you've burned you know, an X amount of fuel more, and was it worth it? Um, so it's, um, it's more like the engine monitor gives you real-time information to make those decisions instead of post-flight uh, reflections. So when we're thinking about how much fuel did we burn on this flight? Well, we can dip at the start and we can dip the tanks at the end and we can see that information. Well, now you can see it while it's happening. And so that means you can make changes while it's happening and the end result will be more consistent with uh, an efficient way to run the engine. So that's a really cool, uh, neat feature of the EDM 830 is the real-time uh, information. Um, troubleshooting and diagnostics are another one. Um, there's actually some really cool features that we can see on the engine monitor that tell us whether things are running properly or not. In the run-up, in flight, we can watch for discrepancies in exhaust gas temperature, any alarms that may sound, and we can uh, do some diagnostics to figure out 
is there anything we can do to remedy this situation? So we'll talk about that one more specifically in the uh, pre-flight module and also the in-flight module. But there's some really cool stuff that you can do uh, to be a little more um, proactive and a little more real-time maintenance engineer-like. You know, we don't want your, you don't want to make a pilot into an engineer necessarily, but um, it's good to have some insight into that world so that we can also contribute and do things uh, to help the safety of the flight. So that's a really uh, great feature of the engine monitor as well. Um, ultimately, installing these units is aligned with our philosophy of um, never stop learning. It, you know, aviation is this industry where uh, it's not just like you um, start learning to fly, you get a pilot license and you're done. It's, uh, it's this constant evolving journey of knowledge and information and experiences. And um, you know, implementing new technology and new equipment into the aircraft is uh, really uh, key in line with that sort of philosophy that um, we always want to keep on learning. There's always more to learn. And the nice thing about aviation is you're never going to learn it all. Even if you spent millions of hours learning up to as much as there is by the time you got there, there would be new information to learn anyways. So it's, it's, a, really, it's a positive thing. It's a really great thing about the industry is it um, provides you with a, a way to um, never get to the end, <laughs> it, which is good because it's about the journey, right? Not the destination all the time. I mean, sometimes. But it's great to um, always have something to always uh, keep us sharp, keep our minds sharp. And, uh, and that's um, a great part of this industry. And so here's a, here's a new piece of technology that gives us a new way to look at old information. Um, you know, like I said, I've been flying these aircraft for 25 years. In fact, this one aircraft as well, CTJ. And um, never have I gained so much insight into what's happening as in this last couple of months. Oh, I didn't realize the fuel burn would be affected so much with this slight power change. Or I didn't realize we we burn this much fuel during a climb, or I didn't realize that um, we could be shock cooling the engine uh, by making these abrupt power changes, and the list goes on and on and on and on, and it's really, really cool to see that, that data, that insight. Um, what also is very neat about this instrument is um, at the end of any given flight, uh, we can pull the data off of there. So it's very simple. We have a USB stick, we stick it in, and, uh, and then we have this really great software um, Actually, there's a uh, shout out to uh, Savvy Aviation. Uh, they have even better software than the JPI guys wrote. So you can upload this software to this uh, web service at Savvy Aviation, and I'll, and I'll put some links in the description below to their website. They have a ton of great um, engine care type uh, information with Mike Bush. He's a really knowledgeable AME in the US. So um, you can see the data after the flight. Every single parameter that's measuring, we can look at on a graph. So if uh, someone is not leaning the mixture out properly, we can see that. <laughs> so you better, you better lean. Um, but we can see the effects of fuel flow and, and exhaust gas temperature and cylinder head temperature, um, even things like altitude and position with the GPS integration. It's, uh, it is like a revelation in, um, in, in data. And uh, it's really, really neat to see. And we're just scratching the surface. Like I said, it's only been a few months that we've had this installed, actually about two months. And we're really uh, loving it so far and, and more to come. But, you know, we realized there is certainly a lot to learn and um, there is not a lot of information out there in a, in a concise way to support that learning. So that's a big part of why uh, myself and my assistant CFI, Mark, we put this uh, presentation together. We spent probably over 100 hours um, getting all this information compiled into uh, six modules for you guys and I hope you uh, enjoy it and get something out of it. And there's actually a, there's actually a seventh module that, um, that we're working on as well, which is an advanced leaning technique. Um, and there's a lot of really great information that's gonna come out on that one regarding uh, operating temperatures and lycoming recommendations, engine manufacturer recommendations versus Cessna POHs. Uh, so a lot of cool stuff there too. Uh, carrying on, um, when will we use this uh, technology, this information? Well, it's incorporated in everything we do, all facets of flight. So from the time we start the engine to doing a run-up, pre-takeoff, climbing, cruise, and descending. Uh, and even after landing, uh, we got the data there available. So it's just integrated into everything that we do. Um, 
short flights, long cross countries. There's different ways to use uh, the engine monitor. There's different ways to set up the aircraft in these scenarios. And so uh, it's just uh, all around useful all the time. It's, uh, it's really cool. Um, where does this fit into the big picture for us? Well, um, we're a training school, so we spend a lot of time teaching flying. Um, here's a, a cruise performance chart. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about these charts and, and how they relate to uh, flying and flight training and also uh, the performance of the engine and what we can expect to get out of things like fuel flow and economy and range and endurance. Um, we might look, for example, at a, a 4,000 foot altitude at 2300 RPM on a standard day and say, okay, we're going to get about 100 knots and we're going to burn about 6.5 gallons an hour at about 55% horsepower. And uh, that's great, but it's all really, in a sense, um, kind of theoretical because we had no way to really measure that in flight other than you could dip the tank before the flight, you can dip the tank after the flight, you can do the math and see how much you burned in that time. But then you're going to factor in different performance like taxi, run up, takeoff, climbing. These are all different fuel burns and they're all uh, going to result in different numbers. But now in real time in the aircraft, we can actually see that. So we can understand um, what the book value is and compare that to the actual performance of the aircraft. And that's something we could never do before. Um, now we can see it in real time, and that's the difference. It's not an afterthought, it's a, it's a present um, realization. And with that realization uh, comes our ability to make changes in real time and affect the outcome at the end. So very, very cool stuff. Um, appreciation for uh, fuel conservation. So, you know, range and endurance. Right on the screen we can see our fuel flow um, how much uh, time we have left at the current power setting in hours and minutes and with the integration of the GPS we can see how much fuel it's going to take to get to our destination and how much fuel we're going to have left in the tank when we land there. So again those allow us to make decisions in real time in the air of uh, do I need to divert to somewhere else to get fuel? Um, will I need fuel at the destination for my way back? Should I notify them by radio that I'm going to be getting fuel? Um, how can I improve the efficiency of the flight overall as a result of this information? And that's something that, uh, again, um, well, some of it couldn't be done before or certainly couldn't have been done as precisely as, as it is here. Um, of course, uh, mixture leaning techniques. I mean, we're talking about um, being able to see in real time uh, the effects of leaning the mixture. So, you know, as we teach flying as, as flight instructors, um, we try to impart the importance of doing certain techniques. Um, but a lot of the time it's hard to quantify or, or to actually, it's not a tangible thing, so they, a student can't really see that change. All they know is, my instructor says this is a good idea, I should probably do it. And maybe at the end we can show them some, some effect that it's had. But now we can show them in real time what's really happening. When you twist that red mixture knob counterclockwise, watch as that number of fuel flow in gallons per hour actually starts to drop down. And watch how that endurance number starts to climb up. And um, those are uh, really powerful effects to buy into um, uh, the reasons that we do things. So it becomes less of a because my instructor says so and more of a because this is the reality, this is what happens when I do A and B, I get C. And uh, that's, I mean, that's amazing. You can't, uh, that right there is value added. Um, insight into the engine temperatures. I mean, we have um, access to uh, cylinder head temperatures, exhaust gas temperatures. And with that information, we can be more proactive in um, taking care of the engine, keeping those within the specified limits and um, and just uh, that will all help to manage um, the aircraft over time and the cylinders and the engine over time and, and essentially reduce costs. So we're talking about reducing expenses. You know, these are not uh, cheap units to install by any means. And uh, I would say probably very rare to see uh, a small training aircraft, uh, especially of these uh, vintage 1976 Cessna 172M model to have such advanced uh, equipment on board. But we feel it was a really great investment into the aircraft, into uh, the business, and into all of our pilots. Um, so we're going to gain more education, and the airplanes are going to 
um, fly longer, better, faster, stronger, <laughs> we can rebuild it. Um, so that's part of uh, why we have integrated that into the, into the big picture. Uh, and again, I touched on um, troubleshooting briefly, but there's some really cool things that we can see and we'll talk more about in the um, pre-flight and in-flight um, modules that discuss troubleshooting. Um, but we can see trends in, uh, in the data, in the graphs. You suddenly look at a graph and you see um, this one bar graph that's way down below the others and you ask yourself, why, why is that happening? What is happening? And what can I do to uh, keep that from happening? So uh, some really cool uh, information with troubleshooting. And um, the fuel burning data, as I mentioned, uh, some really great stuff when connected to a GPS, like, uh, well, the fuel endurance is automatically there in hours and minutes, gallons per hour. And um, when we have a GPS connected, we can see things like the fuel remaining on board when we land at the destination, and also fuel economy, uh, fuel um, range in miles per gallon, that kind of thing. So really amazing insights into um, just the safety, overall safety and efficiency of any given flight. You know, knowledge is power, and here we have a whole bunch of data that we can uh, in interpret and do, um, do something positive with that information. Uh, it's really great for helping us evaluate threats to flight safety. So, you know, these older aircraft are carbureted engines. We spend a lot of time in the training environment talking about uh, carburetor icing and how we can mitigate the risk of carb icing. And um, one of the sensors that we had installed was the carburetor air temperature sensor. So Cessna has a range um, for the danger zone of carburetor ice, uh, minus 15 Celsius to plus 5 Celsius. This is the temperature inside the carburetor, not the outside air temperature. And um, it, we never previously had a way to see this. There are some um, some 172s, some Cessna aircraft that have an older analog uh, carb temperature gauge, and those are always uh, really great. And this one is now a digital representation of uh, that information, so there's a probe in there as well. If we can know whether when we are in this danger zone or not, um, then that's going to help us to mitigate the risk of, uh, of, of having carb ice. And of course, the risk of carb ice, as you probably know, is that we can starve the engine of fuel and air and essentially um, have a, an engine failure in flight if we pick up carb ice and we haven't recognized it. So um, with that probe, uh, we have the insight into uh, mitigating the risk of carb ice even more. Um, so that's uh, an amazing aspect of it. Uh, alarms, there's probably, I think, 20 or 30 programmable alarms for any of these parameters we can say, start flashing red at me when, when this uh, number hits this value. So when uh, the cylinder head temperatures get too high or when the oil temperatures get too high or when there's um, battery voltage that's too high or too low or low fuel in terms of gallons or in terms of endurance, then we can be notified. And um, you know, it's like having another pilot on board, like a co-pilot and, uh, and, uh, and partly a maintenance engineer that's telling you exactly uh, what's happening with the aircraft and uh, things are busy in flight we get distracted uh, we're looking outside we're looking for traffic we're making radio calls we're trying to fly the plane maybe we're talking to passengers um, and maybe we uh, don't have the uh, RAM to scan uh, all the instruments all the time uh, when we're supposed to so at least with these flashing alarms we can be notified uh, of these important things that are happening that we can then make the changes necessary so very cool uh, system with alarms so there's a bunch of um, videos that we've made and uh, then there's some old videos from JPI that are probably 10 plus years old. Um, we've taken those JPI videos and we've chopped them up into a bunch of little quick segments that reflect the modules that we're teaching. So I'm going to show you one of those now. It's, it's relatively brief, but they are um, good to give you some insight into, uh, into what the system does. But um, keep in mind that there have been some software changes over the years since these videos were developed. and um, and so things may not look exactly the same as they do in these videos. Um, but a lot of the images throughout the slideshows are current images that we've taken. Um, and then we're going to eventually be replacing all of the videos with, uh, with our own uh, videos of the same nature. So I'll bring the videos up on the screen and I will make them uh, full screen for you as well. So let me just uh, the the ED, pause the this EDM. guy. And I will actually pull the... Uh, the entire video up here and you can see the that. EDM 730 from JPI is the most advanced and accurate engine monitoring instrument available offering the highest level of safety and reliability 
With the EDM730 acting as a flight engineer, you can enjoy improved fuel economy, reduced maintenance costs, and extended engine life. JPI is a leader in precision aircraft engine performance monitoring. When you fly your piston aircraft, only a small percentage of combustion energy actually moves the piston to produce engine power. Most energy passes into the exhaust pipe as very hot gases. Monitoring the temperature with your EDM will indicate the quality of the combustion process and allow you to troubleshoot potential engine problems quickly. All right, so just a quick video there on uh, JPI's introduction. Um, again, it's an older video and uh, they never really updated some of their um, product videos or training at all, probably because they've transitioned into newer models now, the EDM 900 series, 930. Uh, those, some of those are certified replacements for old gauges too. So a lot of people are going that way. Um, but we didn't really want to, um, our goal is not to um, totally revolutionize the cockpit of a 1976 Cessna 172M. Uh, our goal is to a mix of old and new. So, you know, when we have the, um, when we have the, uh, say, the cockpit of FWQ, we want to keep the traditional um, steam gauges, the pedostatic and suction-driven gauges, but also augment them with some new technology like a Garmin 530 GPS, which itself is, is now not as new technology, but a Garmin G5 HSI to replace the directional gyro and, and add functionality for instrument training, for IFR training, and then add this engine monitor in. So our, our goal is not to um, convert the plane to a glass airplane. It's to uh, keep the simplicity of the original airplane, to keep training relatively simple, but also to uh, make it scalable and uh, be able to teach advanced features in what was once maybe a more basic aircraft. So that's, uh, that's why we're kind of going this direction. So I'll show you, show you some cool things with the uh, display here, and uh, we'll kind of cover some of the information that we see. So um, at the top of the display is uh, a calculated digital RPM and underneath that is a, um, a manifold pressure. Now like I said, uh, this is not a certified replacement for any instruments that are on board. So if there is any instrument on board at all that is also in this uh, EDM, the original one is the one that we need to be looking at. So we're still going to set our RPM based on the tachometer and, um, uh, and we're going to take a note of fuel on board by actually dipping the fuel tanks and understanding what fuel is in there. But this instrument is meant to uh, augment that and support that. And it does an extremely good job at being a secondary instrument. Um, RPM, it actually calculates, which is really neat. It calculates it uh, based off a connection to the magneto, which is really cool. So it measures um, how fast, I think maybe uh, possibly the armature is spinning. I'm not exactly sure which part of the magneto, but it takes the information from the magneto and calculates an RPM from there. And then manifold pressure, um, at least on our, our aircraft, is uh, taken from a probe that's inside the number four um, air induction system, I believe. It's the uh, induction system manifold that they've put a probe in on number four cylinder. So you tr traditionally would not see a manifold pressure on a fixed pitch propeller aircraft, um, but uh, the EDM 830 provides that information. And the reason that um, we got that information um, calculated was to gain this next data field here called percentage horsepower. So the EDM 830 versus the EDM 730, it's basically the exact same unit. It's just a matter of um, the sort of the package that, uh, of sensors and data that you get. So with the EDM 830, you get RPM, um, you get manifold pressure. And when you combine RPM manifold pressure and outside air temperature, which is down here, when you combine those three together, uh, you actually get um, percentage of horsepower. So percentage horsepower is very valuable um, because a lot of our charts are based off of percentage horsepower. If you remember the cruise performance chart that I was just showing you earlier, at 4,000 feet, at 2,300 RPM, we burn 6.5 gallons an hour. We get 100 knots, and that is at 55% horsepower. And why do we care about percentage of horsepower? Well, we want to know how much um, power the aircraft is putting out, and different temperatures affect that, different power settings affect that. Um, but also, when we talk about leaning, and we get into uh, the advanced modules of uh, leaning the engine, 
uh, we have to be very careful uh, when we are leaning uh, and we are at higher power settings. So specifically, you'll see a lot of information from Lycoming, the engine manufacturer, and you'll read a ton of stuff, like I mentioned, uh, on Savvy Aviation and Mike Bush, uh, and they'll talk about leaning as well quite extensively. And when you approach 75% uh, um, horsepower for the engine, um, you have to be very careful uh, when you're leaning um, because you can uh, create a lot of heat, a lot of internal uh, combustion pressure in the cylinders and, um, and you can do some serious damage there if you're leaning too aggressively. Um, so we need to be cognizant of what percentage of horsepower we're putting out because that can determine how aggressively we can lean. 65% and below, you know, we're pretty good to make a lot of uh, aggressive leaning um, changes. But uh, we'll talk more about that in the advanced leaning module. But just as a, as a heads up, that's, that's a big part of why we opted to add the extra sensors for the 830 versus the 730 so that we could make that correlation to uh, the POH cruise performance tables and numbers and see what we get in real flight and then take that real-time information and make real-time decisions on, um, on leaning. And ultimately, it comes down to engine care at the end of the day. So uh, that is that. Um, on the uh, upper side here, this whole band area is a dynamic button menu. So these buttons here at the top uh, actuate what the words below say. So we have the black button, which is actually called the lean fine button, and the white button, which is called the step button. But the, depending on what is written underneath, these uh, labels change dynamically depending on what we're doing. And so the button above it will function that, uh, whatever that menu item is at that time. Then down the right hand side, we have a number of linear gauges. These are all user customizable. So we have set specific uh, gauges here on the right hand side. And we can get great insight into the aircraft, um, what's happening with all these probes. So two, four, six, eight, ten. We've got ten data fields here in real time, constantly changing and moving around. And uh, I know it seems like a lot, like we don't obviously want to spend our time fixating <laughs> inside the cockpit. We need to be looking outside for traffic. Um, but the information is there if you need it, when you need it, and it's always being constantly updated. And it is a remarkable amount of great insight into the engine. Uh, coming down further, we have uh, some graphs. So we have uh, the EGT bar graph. EGT is exhaust gas temperature. So these blue bar graphs represent the temperature of the exhaust gases that have, uh, are leaving the uh, engine after the combustion process has taken place. And then we have the green bar graphs that are a representation of cylinder head temperature. So CHT is um, the temperature inside the cylinder um, that is uh, a result of producing that power and, and uh, that, that combination of fuel and air expanding and creating heat. Um, the CHT is really important. It's important because it tells us um, how much stress the engine is under. And we have also a cylinder head temperature number readout here on the top. So these green bar graphs represent these numbers uh, and we can see this one is a little bit higher at number three and therefore the number is higher at 380. And then we also can see where they are relative to a red line. So the red line actually is, is user customizable as well. We have put our red line at 420. Um, the actual red line for a Lycoming engine, uh, 0320 E2D that is in the 172M, is actually absurdly high. It's, I think, at 500 Fahrenheit. Um, if you ever got that high, you would do irreparable damage to the engine. The metal would change shape and would never change back. So we obviously don't want to ever get that high. 450 would be a um, very, very high-end operational. Y you wouldn't want to go that high unless it was accidental uh, and then come back right away, but you may still be salvageable in, in the engine after the fact. Um, we try to keep our temperatures, uh, generally speaking, we like to keep them under 400. 400 is a good baseline for cruise flight. And if you can keep them under 400 in a climb, uh, even better. Um, but we found that some aircraft, uh, depending on their baffling, and we're always trying to improve our baffling, etc., uh, and, the, and the temperatures outside, the outside air temperature on the day, in a hot summer day, 
Um, you know, we could get temperatures as high as uh, 420, 425 in a climb. So that's kind of where we're trying to keep our top end. Um, at 420, we want the alarm to go off and we want um, people to make a change if they haven't already made a change. Ideally, you uh, are aware of the potential temperatures in the climb based on the conditions and the type of climb you're doing and you monitor the rise in the uh, CHT number on your way up and you try to make changes along the way to keep it um, under 420, at least in our operation. Um, but if not, if you forget or you're distracted, then at least at 420 an alarm will sound uh, visually and you'll see that flashing and then you can make that change. Uh, so you, you need to improve cooling by either reducing the power or reducing the angle of attack. Both those things will add to cooling the lower nose attitude will provide more airflow into the air cooling system. So um, those are our, that's where we have set our alarm. You can set it wherever you like based on your engine manufacturer recommendation. But like I said, 400 is a really good place to be, uh, less than 400 rather, in most cruise flight. Um, in a climb you may see uh, in excess of that, but you really want to manage that heat in the climb as well and try to keep it um, reasonable. So that's one of the things that we will be teaching in in the aircraft um, for this EDM program. Ultimately, you know, this, these training programs we're putting out there online for free for anyone to watch and, and then they should be augmented by um, a ground training session to uh, answer any questions that our students and renters have and then a, a flight to see how this stuff um, works in the aircraft itself. So it's sort of a three-part approach, and this is the first part. And um, if nothing else, uh, you can just take this information as um, as uh, some additional, um, this is how it works, or maybe you're interested in purchasing an EDM, or maybe you have one in your plane and, and you want to maybe gain more insight into it. So a supplement to the, the documentation that's out there by JPI, which is not that comprehensive. <laughs> so hence the need to be more comprehensive. Um, at the bottom here, we have the cylinder numbers, one, two, three, and four. So this just shows us which cylinders we're looking at. Um, one thing you'll notice is that um, although we have exhaust gas temperature bar graphs, we don't have exhaust gas temperature number readouts like we do with the CHT. And uh, the, the display is actually capable of displaying those. However, you have to modify the layout of the screen. And as a result of um, displaying EGT numbers, you will lose some of these linear gauge data fields. And uh, we feel that um, in our operation, uh, our preference is that we gain more insight into the aircraft by having these additional fields than we would by having the exhaust gas temperature numbers exactly. Um, EGT numbers are not a major indicator of um, uh, problems or, or necessarily a, a weight. It's, the number is not as important as CHT. CHT, um, we have limitations with CHT. Uh, whereas um, EGT does not really have a limitation uh, necessarily in, a, in an aircraft. Um, so we are not as concerned with the final number. What does the actual number say? We're more concerned with um, how EGTs are relative to each other. So if one EGT was really high and one was really low, or they were all uh, relatively uniform but one was really high or really low, that would be more of a concern. So the visual bar graph is actually plenty of information for us. And if we need to see those numbers, we can display them uh, down below in this uh, last area here, which is called the numerical display. So the numerical display is a larger um, version of any one of the many data fields that exist. And we can cycle through this display by pressing the step button. And we can see any of these uh, data fields here, as well as any CHT number, any EGT number, and also some uh, fuel efficiency uh, numbers that we don't have on the screen here uh, when, when we're connected to a GPS. So the numerical display is a really handy feature. And it also, um, uh, information will pop up in the numerical display if there's an alarm that goes off. Even if you're not monitoring the numerical display for that parameter and the alarm goes off, then the numerical display will display that, uh, that parameter for why the alarm is going off. So lots of information packed into a tight little space, um, easily distracting, easily overwhelming. You need to know what information you want, where to get it, and when you should be looking there. And uh, that's a kind of a key part of uh, making the most use out of this, where it's not distracting you from actually flying the aircraft. Um, but it's a ton of information that's available, and that's the key, is that uh, it's there, it's calculating in real time. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, um, if we add up all the uh, different sensors that we added to this aircraft, you know, we're getting insight that we've never had before. 
So we have uh, four cylinder head temperature probes, four exhaust gas temperature probes. Uh, we have a fuel flow transducer that tells us fuel flow. We have an RPM sensor. We have a manifold pressure sensor. Um, we have an outside air temperature and we have a carburetor um, air temperature and we have oil temperature and oil pressure and a battery uh, a voltage um, uh, pickup. So uh, all in all this is about 16 <laughs> sensors that we've added to this aircraft. So it's like uh, getting data um, like we've never got data before and like I said in the 25 years I've been flying these types of aircraft and even this one in particular um, I've never been able to see things the way that I see them now and that's um, been really exciting and refreshing to uh, give us something else to do <laughs> some some other way of looking at the data and, and realizing um, pros and cons of what we're doing and we're able to then make changes to how we do things and so it's um, it's allowing us to continue to grow as pilots and instructors as well so very very cool stuff uh, I'll show you a quick video, a JPI video here on linear gauges and, uh, and then we'll carry on this talk in just a moment here. So let me pull that up. I'm just going to pause that one and give you the full screen version here. The linear gauges provide both digital and analog indications for various parameters. The sliding pointer and color range marks gives you a quick indication of where you are relative to the operating limits while the digital values provide precise information. Okay, so again, just these are very quick kind of snippets, but at least it's nice to sort of see, um, to see, see it in, in action. And we're going to replace these videos eventually with some of our own internal videos, but it takes time to do all that. Uh, so the linear gauges, let's take a look. And again, as I mentioned, these are user customizable. Um, we have decided on which ones we want to see, and we've decided on the order we want to see them, and we've made that consistent across the aircraft that these units are installed in, because the consistency is very important to uh, effective training and learning. So at the top we have gallons per hour, it tells us how much fuel we're burning, which is amazing. Uh, then below that we have fuel used, so it tells us how much fuel since we started up, or since we reset the amount of fuel uh, used to zero. And uh, that's a really cool insight too, to see how much we've been burning on this trip. You can compare that on a cross country to what you've calculated on the ground and see how accurate your calculations are. Very neat stuff. Um, fuel remaining obviously is important because it tells us uh, how much gas is left in the tank and maybe cues us to think about landing or getting fuel or whether when we land we should fuel up or not. So are we going to park at the pumps or are we parking um, at the tie down area, etc. So it just adds to the efficiency of the uh, flight overall. And then uh, next to that, uh, below that rather, is um, fuel endurance in hours and minutes. I mean, this is vital information, like amazing. This, we, would, we would do the calculation and the math in our head before, oh, we got 19.6 gallons and we're burning about eight gallons an hour, so that's two hours and change. Um, here we have an exact readout in hours and minutes. And every time we make a slight change to the throttle, Every time we, we adjust the mixture, we really see those, those changes. So the first four gauges are all fuel related and it gives us um, in, amazing insight into the fuel system and the engine uh, fuel remaining on board, critical insight into safety of the aircraft that we've never had before and also just an overall efficiency, like we're gonna need fuel after this flight, exactly, we have this much fuel exactly or you can communicate with the next pilot on the radio ahead of time and say, hey, there's going to be about this much gas when we land, uh, where do you want us? It's a really, really cool thing to see. And also for the, um, for the leaning uh, aspect of it too, when we, can, when we could uh, take a student up to four or 5,000 feet and then start leaning the engine and we can see this endurance just go up by 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, uh, it's a really solid buy-in to, okay, this red knob is actually doing something. So I, I need to pay attention to how to how to do that properly and make the most use out of that. So very neat fuel information. Um, then we have battery voltage, which gives us great insight into the battery. Is the battery uh, charging system working properly? The alternator, is it putting out enough power? Um, what if the aircraft has been sitting uh, on the ground for maybe two weeks, three weeks in the winter time? Maybe you haven't, we haven't flown in a few weeks. Uh, we can check on it regularly by just going into the aircraft, turning on the avionics master, and seeing what the battery voltage is. You know, if it starts getting down below 13, uh, maybe we want to start um, putting a charger on that so that it charges it back up to full. The last thing you want to do is 
uh, come to fly after it's been sitting for a month and um, the battery's dead. Uh, here you could periodically check on it and see um, how it's managing in this idle state in cold temperatures. So uh, very cool stuff with the uh, battery system there. Uh, then we have oil pressure and oil temperature, which again are only a secondary augment to the actual gauges themselves. Uh, so we can compare that to what the gauges are showing us to give us validation that the gauges are, are correct um, and just use them as a quick reference as well. And uh, outside, uh, sorry, is, um, the uh, cooling. Um, so uh, shock cooling is, um, is a real thing. It's uh, maybe harder to um, induce than what was maybe thought years ago, but it's uh, something to monitor and watch for. So we want to be careful not to make abrupt significant power uh, changes because we can shock cool the engine. So this is uh, measured in um, degrees Fahrenheit per minute and Lycoming who makes the engine, our engine, the O320 E2D, um, most Lycoming engines they'll even recommend about 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Fahrenheit per minute of a change. So when we're doing a flight training we're practicing stalls you know we're up at three four thousand feet where the temperature might be kind of cold and we're making a power change from generally cruise power to idle power and if we're making that very abruptly um, we can see those changes in the uh, shock cooling figure and we want to try and keep those under 50, 50 Fahrenheit per minute so that just is a result of making that power reduction more gradual um, if you have been flight training and you remember ever uh, doing air work or even coming into land and you make a, a very abrupt power reduction to idle you get that backfire well that's you know that's gone even too far to the point where <laughs> you've been too aggressive with your power change so at least we can start to see how aggressive power changes are affecting the cooling of the engine and we can manage that so next time you know we take four or five seconds to get from cruise to idle instead of one or two seconds to get from cruise to idle and all those little changes in our practice and procedure um, add to the longevity of the engine overall uh, and the cost of operating overall which in turn um, translates into the cost of learning to fly because um, if it costs us less to operate and then it costs you less to learn to fly and that's just the bottom line so uh, next one is outside air temperature very cool um, probe right next to the uh, pitot tube just outside of the slipstream of the propeller so it's a bit more um, accurate and uh, we can see the temperatures outside. It's very cool to see, no pun intended, it's cool to see how the temperature drops uh, as we climb to altitude. So we know, you know, lapse rates change as we go up, uh, the temperature drops, and it's really neat to see that temperature change in real time. Um, also very great for um, IFR flying, so if we're going to do any uh, flying in cloud in IMC, we want to know that that temperature is above freezing. Uh, you know, once we start getting into two, three degrees Celsius and below, we're getting into this danger zone where there's potentially some airframe icing. So on a spring day or a fall day where it's maybe 15 degrees Celsius on the surface, as we climb to altitude, um, the temperature drops and we need to know, uh, are we in danger of airframe icing? And um, that can help us to um, be proactive and prevent uh, that situation from occurring. So outside air temperature is very cool. And then uh, carburetor temperature, like I mentioned, this is another sensor that we um, opted in for. So we added a lot of sensors. Um, each one of them costs money to add, um, but each one of them gives us a valuable insight and uh, repays us in um, safety, in, in efficiency, and longevity. So the carburetor temperature, you know, Cessna's got that range um, minus 15 to plus 5 that's the carburetor temperature, not the outside air temperature. And now we can actually see what the carburetor temperature is. What is it actually doing inside the carburetor? So aside from being proactive for carb icing by understanding atmospheric conditions like a high moisture days or that, what is it, minus 5 to plus 30 outside air temperature range, now we also have the um, uh, carburetor temperature indicator as well. So if we can stay out of these danger zones, uh, we can increase safety overall. So those are our linear gauges that we've decided to display. There's uh, probably another uh, eight or nine parameters that you could put on these displays. Um, a lot of it is duplicated already in the visual display, CHT and EGT. Uh, but there are some other uh, fuel flow ones and the fuel efficiency ones uh, that um, you could select as well. But uh, that's just our layout that we've decided and in that order that we like. So it's a user preference kind of thing. 
Okay, um, buttonology, this is the, the last slide, so we're just about done here, and uh, we're going to talk about how the buttons work. So basically we have two buttons, as I've mentioned, there's a white button, a white button and a black button. Um, what you see is actually the buttons are on the bottom in this uh, image, um, but they were on the top um, in ours because our uh, device was uh, installed inverted on purpose because the, actually the bulk of the vertical component is offset to the button side. And so we, uh, we wanted it to be that way so that it didn't infringe on the uh, instrument holes below so they were still available. Um, and what they do when they invert it is actually um, swap the buttons so that the uh, step button, the white button, is always on the left hand side and the um, lean find button is always on the right hand side. So although ours, although ours is upside down, the buttons are still on the same side as far as left and right goes. So we have the um, uh, black button, which is uh, lean find, and the white button, which is step. And those are actually um, sort of the default functions of those buttons. Um, step just basically steps through menus, uh, and lean find um, changes menus in a way. It, it alters the data within the menu. The reason it's called lean find is because lean find is a very specific feature of the EDM 830 and 730 and, and previous um, EDMs. And lean find is a is a special um, uh, system that the EDM can do where it can find uh, it can really help you adjust the mixture to uh, the the proper setting that you want based on the power setting that you have. So it can help you optimize mixture leaning, and it uses um, the exhaust gas temperature to do that. So you determine where exhaust gas temperature peaks, and that is ultimately uh, essentially the leanest. Um, uh, well, one of the, it's the most chemically correct, I think it's the most chemically correct actual mixture. And then from there you can decide whether you want to be uh, rich of that or lean of that. Um, typically for us in a carbureted engine, we're on the rich side of that or at peak or rich. And in fuel injected engines, there's a lot of uh, great documentation for running lean at peak now um, that you can do if you had a fuel injected engine and you had this uh, unit installed. Um, so uh, we'll get more into that. That's a... <laughs> That's a whole other uh, animal in the um, advanced uh, leaning um, procedures module. Uh, but if you want to uh, learn a lot about um, leaning and mixture, uh, there is, like I said, on the Savvy Aviation website, Mike Bush does an amazing job with um, many, many articles and many videos, uh, which I'll link to in the description below, where you can uh, take your knowledge of um, your understanding of mixtures and leaning in, in combustion engines to uh, a whole new level. <laughs> it's, uh, you, could, you could specialize just in that part of it, which is really cool. Again, the endless um, nonstop learning and aviation mentality. Uh, there's a quick video by JPI. I'll just put on the buttons uh, real quick here so that you can see. I'm just going to pause this one and I'll show you the full screen one here and have a look. The EDM 730 and 830 work exactly like the EDM 700-800 series, except for a larger display, color, and richer screen detail. Let's have a quick look at the key features. The EDM 730 collects data and displays it for you in a useful way. All functions are accessed by pushing or holding the white step button or the black lean find button, or the two together. Generally, the black lean find button changes data and the white step button moves you to the next item or scan. Okay, so that's, um, you know, again, short segments here and kind of can be kind of confusing. A lot of it you need to just actually get in the airplane and play around and press buttons. Buttonology is kind of a term that refers to uh, the frustration of, um, of navigating menu systems with buttons, uh, especially when you get into things like uh, GPSs, um, what button do I press? I'm stuck in this menu and how do I get out of here? And so that's kind of what buttonology is. And there's only two buttons on this unit. Um, so there's only so much you can get stuck with. Uh, but at the same time, it can be challenging. Now the good news is um, if you see uh, this original uh, video just in the bottom left here, th this is an old uh, EDM, uh, it's an like EDM 800 I think. But um, the old EDMs were just um, not as advanced in that um, the lean find and the step button um, did not have a dynamically changing menu above it. So where you see the button here and the word lean find, the button here and the word lean find, at least in this new uh, EDM, these menu options will change, so depending on the scenario. So 
in one screen this might say lean find, in another it might say plus, and this one says minus, and another one that says add, this one says subtract, this one says okay, this one says back. And so they're dynamic and so they change, and it's a lot more user-friendly interface than the older uh, systems. We had an EDM 760, I believe it was, in the, uh, in the twin engine Aztec that we were operating, and uh, it was a great revelation into engine uh, temperatures, but the user interface was not that great. And so at least with the um, EDM uh, 830 and 730, they've really upgraded the EDM uh, interface. But again, like I said, a lot of the uh, JPI training videos are based on um, original uh, software that they had installed, and they haven't upgraded any of the videos to, to show you new software. Uh, if you see that some of these videos, even the color layouts, the colors and the layouts and the function are different than what the model currently does. And so that's why we're um, replacing a lot of the, move, the videos and pictures, and that's why we've created this uh, slideshow to do that. So uh, very um, briefly, the, uh, uh, the white button is the step button. It steps through menus, so you can consider it like um, moving through the different menu systems, moves to the next item if there's items in a list, or is sort of like an accept or an enter button or an agree button. So it's sort of your, your main like function button and your, and your cycling button. Whereas the lean find button um, changes the data, uh, so it would be like an add or subtract kind of thing, or is also used in that specific lean find mode that I was discussing where we are trying to find the specific peak in exhaust gas temperature. And also, also toggles between uh, menu items of yes and no and that kind of thing. So uh, that's basically it um, for the EDM uh, 8.30 introduction and I know there's a lot there and already we're you know close to an hour in one video but there's just so much to talk about and that's why I want to put these videos out here because um, for our students and our uh, our rental pilots uh, we want you guys to um, come in for the in-class section and be prepared and ask us questions oh I watched this video uh, tell me about this tell me about that and then we can knock this presentation out in a third of the time and um, it can be a more powerful discussion rather than a lecture. So you can spend the time watching these videos and gain the lecture portion. And if you, if we never see you, if you live far away and you, you never come here to fly, then at least you can gain some information about the EDM series. Maybe you have one of these, maybe you're thinking of getting one of these. Uh, what I can say is it's been a revelation in um, insight into the aircraft. I believe that the investment is far gonna be uh, paid for um, by the engine service life and by just increasing our knowledge as pilots in general. So we're into the, uh, I don't want to sound flight services, we're all about advancing our skills as pilots and constantly learning and constantly adapting, integrating new technology, and these systems allow us to do that. So it's a very exciting um, uh, change to our platform, it's very next level integration of old and new, and uh, we're excited to share that with everybody. So this has been module one introduction on the next module, they, they will get a little shorter because I don't have to give you all the backstory, but I do tend to digress a little bit because I... I like to talk about flying, and uh, you can fast forward if you want. Put me at a two-time speed where I can talk like a chimp. Uh, but there's going to be more information coming, another five modules, so tune in to the uh, uh, next module, which is going to be on fuel flow. Number two is on fuel flow, entering fuel data, fuel information, and how we can get the most out of the fuel component of the EDM 830. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.